Okay. Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the BYC, the Duxbury Yacht Club. Uh, first ever uh, historic event this afternoon, so we're happy that you're able to share this event with us today. Uh, really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm Ron Ramsire, and I'm here to learn from these experts as you are with me. Uh, the reason we're doing this is the fact that many of us, most of us, are out there on the race course, and we, the most we see is like the sterns of these boats, you know? The, 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 and uh, this is an opportunity I know from experience that during the sailing season, these people are, the, the experts up here, are very kind, and they're very resourceful, and they answer every question. The problem is, I forget, the answers to all the questions. So we have them assembled here now so that we could all record. We've got this recording and for you to take notes and we'll, you know, hold them to the task. So um, that's the reason for getting together. And I had the opportunity to um, meet with our team, of course, and uh, with with um, Allie here, the, uh, the um, executive director of the DBMS, and as well as the fleet captain at the Plymouth Yacht Club. And um, Ellie uh, Spolsino uh, and Robin um, Gaynor from the Plymouth Yacht Club, as well as our rear commodore, uh, Jessica Williams here, all came up with the same answer when I started speaking with them. We need more people out on the water and enjoying the water. The, we all have the same goals on this bay. And so here's a start today, hopefully, to invite people to come out and, and join us on the water. Um, I've, in your handouts, there, there are four pieces there. Uh, one is um, a list of the things we're going to be doing. Um, Another is the courses, another is resources for sailing, and then the schedule for our racing uh, throughout the summer. Now, there are a couple of ways that you could, if you don't even have a, a sailboat, but you enjoy being out in the water, you can join us. The D Duxbury Yacht Club uh, sailing season uh, welcomes non-members to participate in, in our races. Um, you can come and, and join us. Now, there's a nominal fee. We, you know, we have to pay for the committee boat and for refreshments afterwards and that sort of thing. But you can join us as either a skipper or a, a, a crew member, and we would invite you to come out on any of those races. So look at the calendar there, and you could come out early in the season, like for one race, and just see how you like it. Come, we'll, we'll welcome you and kind of show you the ropes and you might continue on, so you're welcome to come out anytime. There's another way you can join us, and that is on the race committee boat. Uh, the race committee boat uh, is uh, also um, uh, out there, and it's, it's an enjoyable place to be and view the races, and you can you be part of uh, recording you know, who, who uh, comes in first and who comes in second. Um, we have two uh, senior experts here I'd like to identify so that you can talk to them afterwards and, and come up and, and say, how do I join you? And uh, Di, would you just stand up? Di Hunter? <laughs> <laughs> and and at, while you're standing there, uh, Sue Newman. Sue Newman, I want, want you to know Sue and, and Di Hunter. Di, Di is very instrumental and has been for years in our race uh, programs out there. She's the one that helps us determine what the race course is going to look like and where the marks are going to go. And she has a lot of this up here in her head, and it's important for her to be out there to help us place the race course. Sue is the one that kind of manages the race, and um, she sets uh, the time 
the countdown for the race and, and make sure that everybody follows the rules and doesn't have a false start. And if you have a false start, Sue will yell at you, you know, and turn around and get back, you know, this race is over. So get to know them, come out and join the race committee vote. Now, I mentioned that we have, um, we have uh, a, a lot of expertise here, and I, I want to quickly introduce uh, each one. But as it turns out, um, you are aware of the fact that 403 years ago, 403 years ago, the Pilgrims landed in this bay, right? Okay. To put in this into perspective, this panel here, if you add them all up, the years of experience, we have 488 years of experience. <laughs> that's, that's a lot, lot of sailing. So kind of keep that in mind. The Pilgrims, 403, our race uh, experts up here, uh, 488 years. So um, with that, um, I'm going to introduce each one. I want to first say what the rules of the road are this afternoon. We're going to try to leave you with more than 20 tips. And uh, we want to document that. And that's why I've got that page one, so you could take your own notes and write the tips down. Um, each one of these uh, folks will present the points that are on the list there. And um, they will go through their presentation. And then after, at the end of their presentation, if you have questions um, you'd like to ask the presenter on their particular points, um, raise your hand, and they will answer those, those questions at the end of each of the presenters, OK? And um, first, um, I'd like to introduce um, Sam Lawson over here at, at the uh, end of the table. Well. Sam is a third generation Duxbury sailor. Uh, his family, the Lawsons, won their first race in 1931 here. So we've got the third generation. Sam is going to be helping us. And he is a, a Marshall 15 sailor. And his, uh, his winner, he's been the winner of the Summer Series the Old Timers Race, the Midsummer Series, Clark's Islands Trophy, Anniversary Race. He was awarded the DYC Centennial Shield in 2019, which recognizes exemplary seamanship, racing skill, persistent effort, and sportsmanship. So that, Sam, raise your hand. Sam. <laughs> now we have, we have the fourth generation Lawson here next to Sam. Mo Molly Lawson Barrett, she's the fourth generation Duxbury sailor. She's a two-time winner of the College Sailing National Championships, two-time winner in team and fleet racing, and she's an all-American sailor. She's a co-winner, and going back before almost the college days, I guess, a co-winner in a Marshall 15 for the summer series here, and uh, she won the summer, Midsummer Series and the Clarks Island Trophy. And with her dad, uh, they won the Summer Series completely last year. Greg Hunter, Greg, Greg, raise your hand. Greg, related to Di here. Uh, Di is the first generation. Greg is the second generation sailor. He is the winner of the Summer Series in 2021, the Old Timers Race, the Clarks Island Trophy three times. And what's interesting, if you've never seen this, I highly recommend this. For 47 years, Greg has been raising in the spring and lowering in the fall the DYC flagpole out here. And um, he's, he does it personally by climbing up to the very top of that thing. And he puts the top mast on, the gaff, and the yard, uh, yard arm. So uh, Greg, we hope um, you have many more years of uh, putting that up there. And, uh, <laughs> uh, David Corey, David, raise your hand here. David Corey, he's a second generation. He's a, he started out with the Beetle Cat. He had the season championship. He was a Highlander season championship twice, Midsummer Series in the Highlander, Tune-Up Regatta, Regatta Day, Anniversary Race. On the Flying Scots, 
He was a season champion five times. His Midsummer Series twice, Regatta Day three times, and the Marshall 15, where I watch his stern out there in the races, and the Marshall 15, uh, he's a, a season championship four times, Midsummer Series, Old Timers Race four times, Regatta Day twice, Tune Up Regatta, Anniversary Race five times. Other, he was a Massachusetts Bay Men's Championship second place, and in the Marshall 15, he was a national champion one time. So uh, I think I know now why David uh, bought a bigger house uh, so that he could, you know, has a bigger trophy room. You know what I mean? <laughs> more boats. <laughs> more boats. Uh, and David's going to uh, start us off today. Jed Lowry, Jed, raise your hand. Jed? Uh, Jed is a second generation sailor. And if you look in the directory, he owns the whole, virtually the whole pintail records between he and his father they've won nine times uh, he, he's won six times with his father David and then he's won five times on his own with Althea 2 and the pintails and it's a sloop rig boat so he's going to talk a little bit about sloop rig uh, boats and in, in terms of his uh, talk um, we have uh, Ali Spolsino the executive director of the Duxbury Bay Maritime School Ali raise your hand there um, and Allie has been sailing for 29 years. She, she grew up in the DBMS programs here in Duxbury, and she's enjoyed sailing in uh, the DYC Summer Series in a cat boat and a pintail fleet for many years here. And she's crewed on larger boats and uh, been learned to, learning to sail on smaller, and she loves to teach anyone how to enjoy uh, sailing out there. And Hopefully, I think we have a good relationship with Allie and the people over there. Um, they've got a, a great um, Flying Scott uh, program there, and David Corey is uh, starting up again the Flying Scott uh, fleet here in coordination with uh, the people over at DBMS, and, and this is very exciting for all of us. Phil Morse, Phil, raise your hand. Phil is uh, from the Duxbury Bay Maritime School. He's been sailing for 19 years. And he's been sailing since childhood and been com uh, sailing competitively si since a very young age. And he began uh, coaching kids after being a racing participant himself at DBMS. And he's uh, been uh, teaching, uh, coaching kids competitively over there as well. And uh, so we look forward to having Phil uh, share his experiences. Allison Shane, Allison also from DBMS, she's been sailing for 22 years. And she began coaching after being a racing participant in DBMS sailing and has been competing for 15 years and has coached the high school and the collegiate level. She enjoys teaching students of all ages. And then finally, um, Jessica Williams. Jessica? Jessica, there you are. <laughs> um, Jessica is our rear commodore and she's in charge of operations uh, at, at the club and uh, she's been doing, um, she's been sailing out here for many years and second generation uh, as her mother was a sailor here. And she has uh, developed over the last several years a tremendous interest in sailing among women of the Duxbury Yacht Club. And, and every, any given Thursday or night of the week, they socially sail. And there might be 30 or 40 out there, thanks to Jessica and what she's done. And what she's going to end up our talk today by explaining some things that are, she's brought to us to help us do a better job of managing our regattas here and incorporating the non-members into this, the system here. So that's, that's how we're going to end up. So again, um, we're going to go fire one by one by one, and at the end of each presentation, feel free to ask questions. So with that, David, Corey. Oh, 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 Charlie, that was not, I did not do that on purpose, okay? <laughs> Charlie Clapp, last but not least, Charlie is a second generation uh, Marshall 15 sailor out here. He, he's the winner of the Old Timers Race, the Summer Series second place three times, Midsummer Series, he has the Margaret and Frank B. Lawson Trophy two times, the Clark Silent Trophy, and is the former 
uh, chair of adult selling. And there's one other very important thing that kind of gives you a sense of the culture and, and, the, and the kind of competition we have. In 1984, many of you know this, 1984, Charlie represented the United States at the Olympics. And he brought home a silver medal for America. So, Charlie, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you. Great. Well, we have a lot of material to cover today, <clears throat> so I'll try to go fairly quickly. My job is to just get this started with uh, helping us figure out the basics of what makes a sailboat go. How does the wind operate on the sails? How does that generate some sort of force? And how does the force change as we change the direction of the wind? So um, here is a kind of diagram that, that you've probably seen showing airflow over uh, an airfoil. Thank you, Ron. Uh, and this would be a representation of what's called laminar flow. You can see that the wind is coming along and then is bent a little bit by the sail, but it is going in smooth lines, right? So you can think of layers of air moving across, and so we'll call this laminar flow. You can see that it begins as it just exits the back of the sail. It's beginning to get turbulent um, and sort of a chaotic flow that's not ordered. Um, and turbulent flow is, creates a lot of drag. That's bad. Usually you have laminar flow over most of the sail, but it can start becoming turbulent even before it leaves the end of the sail. So we can get a better sense of that if we let this flow and you can see again that the turbulent part separating from the back of the sail and then flowing past. So there are a lot of different ways of thinking about this. Um, I want to show, uh, let's see. Okay, so the question is why does this make a, a sail push a boat? One way of thinking about it is that this is bending the direction of the airflow. And so as the wind, wind comes in, it's being bent in that direction. And it's just like you know, shooting a pool ball up another pool ball. That's going to exert a force in this perpendicular direction. Another way that you've probably heard about flow creating a force with a sail is the Bernoulli effect. And that is that the airflow going across the sail is going much faster here than here. And when air moves faster, the Bernoulli effect is that that creates suction. And so there's lower pressure here than here. And you can think of that as pulling the sail in this direction. A third way to think about it is that the air is, because the air is moving much faster here than here, there's actually kind of a net circular flow, what the aerodynamic, aerodynamicists would call vorticity. And these are all kind of different ways of looking at it. I, um, I had a friend visiting last weekend, a guy who designed experimental aircraft for Boeing for 40 years, and I said, what's really the best way to think about this? And he said, I mean, you can do all these computational fluid dynamics things and stuff like that, but let's just think of it as you're bending the air and that creates a push on the sail. And that's a simple way for us to think about this. And so we'll just think about a force that's perpendicular to the sail um, that is the result of that sail bending the direction of the airflow. Now, if you want to move um, the airflow even more, you can think, well, let's just pull in the sail. Now I'm going to shoot the wind down like that, and that should direct the air more, and that should give me more force. But what happens is that the airflow separates from the sail. You can see how turbulent it is. And we no longer have laminar flow, and all this air up here is not being directed down in a new direction. It's not being directed down in a new direction, and so it actually doesn't create very much force. Um, and so we really better let the sail out and let that flow reattach over the sail as we start to let the sail out. And you can see now that streamline is beginning to follow along the sail. It's still a little turbulent. Now it's completely attached, and now we have a nice airflow that's going to give us good force on the sail. Now, this is an example of pulling your sail in too far, but it's also the kind of thing that happens every time you tack. So you need to give the sail time to reestablish 
the attachment to the sail. Um, and I'll point out later, sometimes you may want to head off a little bit so that this flow has a better chance of attaching to the sail. Okay, let's put this in the context of a boat. So we've got wind coming from the top and we've let the sail out. This would be a boat reaching. And the wind uh, generated force is perpendicular to the sail. Um, and most of the force is pushing the boat forward, but the arrow's pointing down. So there's also some force acting on the mast that's trying to push the hull sideways. So the hull is gonna slip, but we have a centerboard. And so the centerboard is going to resist the downward component of the force and basically exert a compensatory force. And then we just take the vectors. This is the force forward. That's the force that's counteracting the sideways slip. And we end up with a net force resulting from the wind and the centerboard that is in the direction of the boat um, and is basically a little bit less than what would be on the sail, but pretty much. Now, it's kind of useful to start making a plot of what the wind force would be at different points of sail. So we'll take that green arrow and put it on that plot like that. So at 90 degrees to the wind, you have a certain amount of force. And under most of the sailing conditions, the speed of the boat is gonna be proportional to the force on the boat that's generated by the sail. So this is also a plot of how fast we're gonna go at different headings. Okay, let's pull the sail in a little bit. And now, ah, that's terrible. We're generating a lot of turbulence. We no longer have that large force from the sail because the flow is no longer attached to the sail. So there's less force. Also, the centerboard has, more of it is pointed downward. So the centerboard has to exert a larger force to keep us going straight. And as a result, the net force is really not as much. Um, so that's not, you don't wanna pull the sail in. And what we have always been taught is that you let the sail out until it just begins to luff and that's gonna be the best um, trim for the sail. It's the best trim for the sail for two reasons. One is that you're gonna get nice laminar flow across the sail and that generates the most force. And the second is that the direction of the force is more in line with the direction that you want the boat to go. So very simply, let the sail out till it luffs, pull it in a little bit, and that's what you wanna do. Um, well, we've got some other points of sail. We could head the boat up. The sail is still kind of the same orientation relative to the wind. Now, the force is a little bit more sideways to the boat. The centerboard has to generate a lot more lateral force to counteract the side slipping. And we end up with a forward force that is less, and we can plot that on the polar diagram. Um, and let's pull the sail in a little bit more. Now we've got a lot of side force, a lot that has to be resisted by the centerboard. And if you can see that little green arrow there, that's not very much forward force, but there's still forward force, the boat will go. And if we really wanna pull the sail way in, what we would call pinching, then there's hardly any component of the force that's going forward. Most of it's trying to push the boat sideways. The centerboard is counteracting that, and there's a little tiny bit of forward force that we could plot right up there on the polar diagram. So you can point pretty close to the wind, maybe 30 degrees off the wind, if you really need to, but you're not gonna go very fast. Um, what about in the other direction? Let's let the sail out and start heading down. Um, now, the, because this is pretty much perpendicular to the boat, the force perpendicular to the sail is directed exactly along the direction of the boat. Centerboard doesn't have to do anything. And you may as well pull the centerboard up because that centerboard in the water is generating drag and you don't need the centerboard, so let's get rid of the drag and pull the centerboard up. And now pretty much all of the force is directed along the direction that the boat wants to go. And we've got a pretty good speed uh, in what we would call a broad reach here. Um, how about further down? Well, there's a problem. What you'd like to do is let the sail out and have that flow be laminar and attached, but there's a side stay there. 
And so you can't let the boom out any further. Now, in a laser, you could think about letting the boom out farther, and that might be a, a good strategy. Um, but in a blind scot or a pintail, that's as far as it's going to go. Um, so now we're in a region where the flow is no longer laminar, it's less efficient. And so we're gonna get less force out of that. I mean, the wind is still pushing on the sail, but just not as efficiently. And so now our force vector is in this direction. And then going straight downwind, um, the wind just has to separate to go around the sail. There is wind pushing on the sail, but it's not an airfoil at all. It's like a barn door. And there's just, you can think of it as the sail creating a lot of drag and it's dragging the boat down. So there's not very much force that's generated by a sail in this turbulent or non-laminar configuration. And we would draw the little green arrow about here. Um, okay, well let's now just kind of look at all the different arrows that we generated, figuring out the different directions of the boat. And we got one and another, and we can kind of draw this yellow line to represent the speed that the boat would go at any angle of sail. This is called a polar diagram. And of course, it's gonna change a lot. If the wind is less, the whole diagram is gonna to collapse towards the center. You're not gonna go very far, very fast. Or if you change the sails, that might change something. Certainly, it's gonna be different for different boats. You know, a catamaran or a planing laser is going to move through the water a lot differently than a Marshall 15. And so this is really gonna change uh, a lot depending on boat, wind, waves, conditions, and so forth. Um, here's an example of polar diagrams that have been plotted for a number of different types of boats. Um, this one is nice because it shows what the speed would be at different wind speeds going from about three knots up to about 30 knots. Um, and here's another one and here's another one. Now there are a couple things, ways that we can use the polar diagram to figure out what the best point of sail would be. So say we're going upwind and the goal when you're going upwind is to get as far windward as fast as you can. So we can go really fast if we go perpendicular to the wind, but that's not gonna help us at all. We can point almost to the wind, but we go very slowly. So the way you optimize the speed to windward is to say, how can I get to a lateral line perpendicular to the wind? And basically what the polar is telling us is that you might want to head at about 45 degrees in order to maximize that speed to windward. You can go faster this way, but it's not taking you close to the wind. You can go close to the wind, but you're not going as fast in the other direction. That said, we can use this range back and forth for tactical or strategic considerations. So for instance, say there's a, uh, we're on starboard tack and a boat just tack to leeward of us and it's throwing some bad wind at our sail, we'd really like to be able to move away from that boat. And so we might head up a little bit, maybe 40, 40 or 45 or 40 degrees, and we won't go as quickly, but we'll be able to move up away from that other boat. And so you, you kind of think about where you are on the polar, you're willing to give up some speed to get away from that boat. Or you're pretty sure that there's gonna be a big shift to the right. And if you get over to, to that spot first, when you tack, you're gonna be way ahead of the other boats. So maybe you wanna head off a little bit, increase the speed, you're not getting to windward as fast, but you're getting over to the right faster than the other boats. And so that might be where you, you wanna work a little bit different part of the polar. How about downwind? Um, here, we, if say the mark is straight downwards, straight to leeward, then the idea is to maximize the distance towards the mark. And here with this particular polar, you can see there's kind of a hollow down near 180 degrees. And what that's telling us is that if you go straight downwind, you're not getting to the mark as quickly as if you went off at some angle. And so here you can basically go off at an angle there. You're going away from the mark, but you're going way faster. And so you can actually get downwind faster. Of course, the mark's down here, so then you have to jibe and go down this way. So that's something that a laser would do. 
and a Flying Scot would do, but a pintail and a marshal have a different shape of a polar. It doesn't have the hollow here. And for them, the fastest course downwind is directly towards the mark. Okay, so you need to know the boat. You got, need to have a sense of how far, if, you're, if you are a flying spot, how far off angle is really the best way to maximize that speed to leeward. Um, finally, I just want to point out something to another way of thinking about the airflow over a sail. Um, and here is a really good example of why you never want to get behind a boat. So as the wind is coming across this windward boat, two things are happening. The air is coming along here and it's becoming turbulent as it exits the back edge of the sail. And now this boat is not getting nice clean streamlines. That turbulent air is not going to attach to the back of the sail and you're going to get much less force um, if you're the boat to leeward. The second thing that people don't think about as much is that the net effect is to change the direction of the wind. I mean, that after all was the explanation that we used in the beginning. That's what generates force. The wind direction gets changed. And it's changed here, but even, you know, one, you know, half a boat length or more, the direction of the wind is not the same as the direction of wind would be if you were far away. So this boat is actually getting a header. It can't point as high as the boat there. And so that's not good either. So the two bad effects are turbulent air and the fact that you actually have to head down because the boat ahead of you changed the wind direction. It can even be an effect if you're not directly below here. You might have laminar flow here because the streamlines aren't that messed up, but still the wind direction has changed a little bit. This boat has to head down and now because it's headed down, it tends to go into the bad air there. And this effect can be surprisingly powerful. If you're on the ley line going towards the mark and there's a boat five boat lengths back also on the ley line, that boat back there may think that it's got nice clean air, but really the boat ahead is screwing up the wind direction and creating a little bit of turbulence. And a boat, even four or five boat lengths back, can, will slip back and back and back because of that. And then finally, there's the classic sort of blanketing situation that you would, um, that we all know about. If you're tr trying to overtake a boat ahead, the best way to do it is just to park on the boat's wind. And as this wind goes around your sail, it's not hitting that sail at all. And you can, if you aim your sail for the boat ahead, then you can pretty quickly um, pick up some speed. A nice way of doing that is we usually have a wind pennant on the mast. And so just move your boat so you're aiming the wind pennant at the boat you're trying to catch and that's a good way to go. So that's it, that's what I wanted to say and if there are any questions, I can take them. Hi, question. I would say for most sailboats, it varies a lot. So a schooner, that rig isn't very efficient. You might be going at 50 degrees or even less or even more. An ice boat is probably sailing at something like 20 degrees. The, the sail is holding so tight. Um, I guess what I'm saying, oh, sorry. I guess what I'm saying is you'd be surprised at how badly the boat ahead is messing up the air. And so it may be that this boat, you think you're in clear air, but you're really not. The boat ahead is deflecting the wind a little bit. Yeah, you're talking about the weather of the boat. Oh. So like the wind stopped doing it, even though it's pretty much higher than the wind that you're looking at, but it's supposed to be bad. And then I think when you're Yeah. It is. It, it's hard to know without seeing the exact situation. Um, 
but you know, maybe you want to let the sail out a little bit and get more speed. Maybe. Maybe you want to get front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I should leave time, unless there are more questions, leave time for other people. Clark comes in. Nice to see you all. Um, so Ron uh, read my accolades that way, and uh, um, you notice I came in second a lot, and now you know why. <laughs> when you look at David. Um, the good thing about rowing and rowing in the Olympics is when you come in second, you win a silver medal. You don't come in second, so that maybe that's why I'm a lot happier rowing than sailing. <laughs> but uh, be that as may, I do not. I do know how to do some degree of math, and. Um, We've got 19 tips to go, five minutes there. We've got another hour and a half. So this is the most important thing that we're going to use today. I'm going to set this for yeah. five minutes for every speaker from now on out. And when it rings, you're done. <laughs> so um, that's, my, that's my contribution to the cause. Uh, sail trim, David's um, uh, looked at it in, in many different ways. Each of the things I'm going to talk about, um, really I'm just going to talk about an objective. What's the objective of sail trim is to keep as much of your sail working as possible. It's as simple as that. How do you keep as much of your sail working as possible? Because that's what's going to drive the boat forward. So um, if you look at what drive is, drive comes from the shape of the sail. Okay, And what does shape come from? It comes from three things. It's the angle of attack, it's the draft of the sail, and it's the twist of the sail. So what's the angle of attack? Just think of where your mast is going. It's like a razor edge going into the wind. right? That's your, that's your angle of attack. Um, so um, you sit there in a cat boat, and David's going to um, speak on the backside of this with Marconi rigs or sloop rigs, but in a cat boat, you only have a few things you can use to change all three of the things I just mentioned, the angle attack, the draft, and the twist. You've got a peak halyard, you've got a throat halyard, you've got a main sheet, and you've got outhauls. That, that's pretty much it. That's all you got to work with. <laughs> you can move your body weight around. There are other things you can certainly do to change what your sail might look like. But those are really the things that are available to you to make the sail um, uh, ultimately work as hard as it possibly can. So um, if you look at the angle of attack, it's pretty much driven by the main sheet. It's like where, how, how much do you trim that sail in? Um, and, and David made a good point. If you're, if you're heading into the wind, um, that's one thing, but at any other point, you can just let that sail out until it luffs and then pull it in a little, and now you've got your angle of attack pretty much taken care of. It's really as simple as that. So if you want a tip and trick, don't make it complicated. Let the sail out, it luffs, pull it in a little bit. If that's the direction you want to go, you're golden. You've got your angle of attack pretty much nailed from that standpoint. Um, one word I would use is there's a groove, and, and sailors that have been sailing for a long time feel it, they see it, they can hear it on the hull, they can, they can hear when the boat is going along. I, most of us know when the boat is not moving and it's stalled out, but when the boat's moving along, that's, that's the groove that you're looking for, and at that moment, take a look and see what your sail looks like, because that's what you want it to look like if the wind conditions stay pretty much the same. So that's the other thing, if you find yourself moving along in a nice groove, making, uh, I call it making trees on the other boat. You look over and you see trees arriving behind them, then that means you're going faster. If you see trees disappearing, then they're going faster than you. So if you're making trees, you've got a nice little groove and um, keep rowing there. So tip number two, look at the trees, make trees. Um, do something different if you're losing trees because they're going faster than you. Um, the draft, the draft of the sail really changes with wind conditions, as does everything with sail trim. So that um, uh, comes and goes. But outhauls on the gaff and the boom are what change the draft. That's what changes the depth of the sail. So it's lighter weather, get a little bit more draft. Tighten those outhauls up if it's, if it's heavier weather. Flatten that sail out a little bit. The peak shifts that draft forward and aft. So the same thing, you can adjust you can adjust your, um, your draft to some degree there. And the twist um, is really more prevalent in cat boats because you've got this gaff that'll always lay out, right? Um, um, so you're always up against it that way. And so you use the peak halyard, um, it, you know, but at some point that it's gonna just, w when you, if you sheet that in, you're just gonna start pulling your boom down. You're not gonna be pulling it in anymore. So it's, at some point um, you can 
flatten your sail out completely and remove all the twists, but you'll completely stall yourself out. So I have to stop. <laughs> Two most important things, last tips, sharpies. Go out and sail. Find, find the point where your halyards in a moderate breeze, in a moderate day, get your, get your windward trim, mark your halyards, mark your main sheet, mark your centerboard pennant. Just and then, if it's heavier, you pull them in a little. If you at least you at least you have a point of reference to play around with. But sharpies are awesome. I didn't get to tell uh, telltales, but these are your best friends when you're out on the water and trying to trim a sail. I have four on the luff of the sail. I have two on the leech of the sail. In a perfect world, they're all riding perfectly together, and that never happens. So look at your middle ones. Don't look at the top. Don't look at the bottom. Focus on the two middle ones. I have to follow my own rules. <laughs> David, you're up. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to try to use the whiteboard and still stay within microphone range. Um, okay, so what's different about a sloop? <clears throat> um, very simply, you've got two sails. And so one of the things to think about is how do the two sails work together if, especially if you're going to windward? So I'll move these out of the way. Um, and can you hear me, microphone? Yeah. So again, if you have the wind coming like this and the hull is more or less um, more or less at 45 degrees. This is a pretty crappy picture. <laughs> then um, you have the mainsail that may be coming out sort of like this, but you also have a jib that is also creating an airfoil with a little bit of overlap. And so both of these are bending the direction of the air so that the air is being deflected that way. And as it comes around this side, then it's being deflected. But the windward side of the jib is also helping deflect the air and keeping air on the back side of the main in order to help keep it laminar. So the big thing with trimming the jib is really pretty simple. You don't want to choke off the slot. If you pull this in so tight that the air can't get between the jib and the main, then you've screwed up the whole airfoil and the boat starts going pretty slow pretty quickly. The rule of thumb in a flying Scot is that the leech here should be parallel to the center line of the boat. And if you're to windward steering, you can't see the leech of the jib. So most flying Scots have a window halfway up the mainsail so that you can see the top batten and then trim the jib so the top batten is just oriented four and a half. And half an inch on the jib can make a difference um, in creating that sort of perfect um, trim for the jib. There's another thing is sometimes with the jib, you just don't want as much power from the jib. And you'd really like the top of the jib to be less efficient. So as the jib comes up, you'd like to allow more twist in the jib. The top half is sort of falling off. It's not producing as much force. And the way you do that is to move the jib lead aft so that you're pulling the bottom up more and pulling the top in less, and that allows twist. Um, anyway, that's for the airfoil part of it. The way that you change the shape on, of the sail in a sloop is, and I will just show the sail sort of coming like this. There are basically four controls for changing the shape. In general, a good airfoil likes to have the maximum draft about two thirds of the way back. So, we have this line, it's a straight line, you might think of that as the boom. And one question is where is the maximum draft? And the second question is how far away from the boom is it? Um, and how do you control that? So 
as Charlie mentioned, one way of controlling the draft is simply to pull out on the outhaul. And most mains are cut with a kind of a shelf so that the cloth along the bottom isn't really going to be pulled tight. But as you pull this out, that's going to pull the sail up and create a shallower sail. Why would you want a sal shallower sail? If it's heavy wind and a big full sail is giving you too much force and tipping the boat over, by reducing the amount of draft, then you reduce the, the fo overall force. There's less force heeling the boat over and you can manage better. Um, so this might control the draft, but the question is how do you control the position of the draft? And on the sloop, you do it by um, pulling on the, basically the tension on the lock. And that's done with a control at the bottom of the sail called the Cunningham, which a lot of you are familiar with. And in general, if you are pulling the cloth out this way, it tends to pull cloth in that way. And that would move the position of the maximum draft a little bit farther forward. Um, that would be too far forward. You'd like to, if it looked like that, you'd want to ease off on the tension and let the draft move back. The other way to change the position of the draft is to bend the mast. So if you have, here's the normal mast like this, and if you bend the mast like that, then the sail is pulled forward and that also tends to flatten it. How do you bend the mast? Well, if you had a backstay, you could do it easily, but we don't have backstays. So you put a lot of tension on the boom vang that pushes the boom forward and bends the mast that way. And that's another way of flattening the sail. And my five minutes are up. lot of good discussion so far. One of the things that I just want to uh, say sort of from in general, this is what I carry with me every time I go out on the boat. Um, no one has talked about sort of what's the gear that I, we bring. I have my radio. In my bag are always a couple of pairs of sailing gloves for both me and my crew in case it's windy or it's not windy. I certainly want to help my crew out. A pair of binoculars, I'm just sort of the standard gear that I grab and take with me all the time. And I keep it in this bag, and it, it's a great way to travel around. Um, I'm a cat boat sailor, so, you know, always dealing with the gaff rig. We're talking about, I'm talking about heavy winds right now. Um, what do you do differently in heavy winds? Well, having crew is really important, but occasionally you don't have crew. And, you know, single-handing a cat boat is easy to do unless it's really windy, and then you've got trouble. Um, there are two schools of thought with a, a cat boat. We've talked about you know, eliminating the draft and flattening the sail out, and flattening that sail out means the wind's not going to be pushing you over quite as much. Uh, we had the Marshall Nationals here a few years back, and the um, gentleman from Quantum Sails, all my life I've been taught you know, with a gaff-rigged boat, Pull the peak up as high as you possibly can, which flattens the sail out. Now the sail is flatter. There's not as much draft. You're not getting heeled over quite as much. And he looked at me and he's like, no, Greg, you don't want to do that because that's putting the sail up higher and actually giving you more leverage. He said, ease your peak off, which to me seemed counterintuitive. But he said, if you ease the peak in a gaff rigged boat, you're opening up the top of the sail and the wind will be able to let be let out of the sail and the bottom half of that weird sail um, is still the driving force and it's going to allow you to move through the water faster. I was like, okay, well that's interesting, I'll try that. Well, I've gone out racing and Sam has got his peak up as high as he possibly can and I've eased my peak and the two of us are neck and neck half the time. So works for me, doesn't work for him, works for him, doesn't work for me. Make your boat go fast. And if you're going fast, do what works for you. Um, and if it's not working, as Charlie said, 
try something else because if you're not going faster than the other boats, change it up. Otherwise, it's not going to help you. Um, when the wind is really pushing, sometimes you can sheet in a little bit tighter and pinch a little bit because it's more forgiving when you've got a lot more wind. And you can head up a little bit higher so that you're almost luffing. And sometimes, you know, I'll carry a luff because it's better to keep the boat as flat as possible because that's the best way to move the boat fast through the water. And if I'm carrying a little bit of a luff, I'm not getting knocked over quite as much. You may be thinking, oh, counterintuitive. The sail's luffing. I'm not going as fast. But if I'm not getting knocked down, you get knocked down. The boat's rounded up into the wind. Then it's luffing badly. Then you bear off a little bit. You're heeled over again. Then you get knocked down, rounded up into the wind. Every time you get rounded up into the wind, you're going slower. So if you can just stay between too much wind and luffing, there's a little bit of a luff and you can move along. Again, if it's working and you're going faster, keep it up. But the bottom line is you want to keep the sails full, you want to keep the boat moving, and whatever you can do in the wind to allow you to maximize your speed is the best thing to do. You know, maybe you keep the sail out a little bit and you're bearing off a little more. To David's point, you know, you're not pointing as high, you're pointing a little bit lower, but you're at a better point of sail, so you're going faster. So play with the main, play with the halyards, and out get the crew. Yep, well, play with the outhauls initially. I mean, that's the key thing, you know, as you're getting ready to sail out, decide what, what's the wind conditions going to be. And, you know, frequently we'll be out there on the water between races and all of a sudden you'll see somebody's sail come down. You're like, oh my God, are they having a problem? No, the wind is picking up and they've adjusted their outhauls on the water. Sail goes back up again and they keep racing. So watch your competitors and see what they're doing and try it and, you know, go fast. So I'm back, uh, light winds, not heavy winds. Um, I said before, what, what's the objective? The objective is to maintain speed. If you're out in light winds, especially in Duxbury Bay, it's always, a, it's always pretty fluky. Um, uh, oftentimes it's very fluky. Uh, we'll get to waves later on, but um, you're fighting not only the waves, but all the Grady Whites on the bay. So it, that makes it an adventure as well. Um, but bottom line is you're trying to um, maintain your speed um, that's the objective, and um, if you if you're if you're trying to do that, don't try to point high. You know, I'm talking cat boats, but even in a Marconi rig, you know, you, if you pinch that up when it's really light, it's all about power. It's all about boat speed and just keeping that boat moving. Um, you know, simple terms. If in doubt, let it out. Sorry, this thing's like rustling all over the place. Um, yeah, sorry. There we go. Um, so, if in doubt, let it out. Um, that's that's the easiest way to think about light wind sailing uh, from Just that standpoint. Um, uh, we talked about the you know you don't have a lot to work with, but the outhauls are one of them. So if it's a light wind day, I always loosen those outhauls. I don't adjust the gaff for very much, um, as Greg says. You're not going to drop that down, but it's pretty easy to reach out and adjust your uh, um, adjust your outhaul on your boom. Let the throat down a little bit. Even if you get a few scallops, get get some scallops on the boom. Get some scallops along the th you know from the throat down uh, to the clue. Um, that's just going to give you the draft and the in the belly and the sail that you need on a on a uh, on a light wind day. Um, I talked about telltales momentarily before, but um, I mentioned it particularly on a light day. Follow the mid follow the mid uh, telltales first. They're going to tell you what's going on on a light day. The top ones are going to flutter around. The bottom ones are not going to tell you very much but the middle of the sail is driving. So those are the ones that you want to be looking at. Um, always keep in mind, nine foot tide, eight foot tide, 12 foot tide, current has a much bigger impact when light winds, right? If you get four knots of breeze and you get a one knot current, that's 25% of what you're up against. So on a light wind day, absolutely be, um, know where your tides are going, whether they're pouring out of the bluefish, pouring out of the back river or otherwise, it's gonna have a much bigger impact. Um, Main sheet, um, I've got a double block on a light wind day. I release one of those, so I've got a single line off the stern. I have a, a main sheet that floats, um, so it doesn't hold any water. There's nothing worse when you've got a ton of, 
kind of uh, main sheet, drag it in the water, loads up with water. You're trying to get the boom out on a light wind day and you've got your crew up there, you've got a boom crutch out there otherwise. So um, if nothing else, just take one of the loops off your, uh, off your uh, boom uh, that way. Um, minimize tacking in a marshal. I mean, you're giving up three, four boat lengths on a light wind day every time you tack. So think about when you want to tack, find a puff, find a calmer spot, wait until the Grady White goes by before you give it a go. Um, that makes a huge difference. Um, huge one, stay close to the starting line. I can't tell you how many times after a race, you know, somebody's enjoying their sandwich and doing their Dixie over here. Sue goes into her sequence and she's not waiting. And you're just on a light wind day, you are out of the race before it starts. Um, so likewise, try to get out there early, something I am pathetically bad at. Um, uh, pay attention to the other fleets, look at the fleets in front of you, look at flags, look at any clue you have around the bay that'll give you an idea of where some wind is coming from um, that way. And uh, same, when you do hit waves, always power up, just fall off a little bit, let that sail out a little bit, get through the waves, keep the boat moving. Because once you do, if anybody's sitting there doing a hobby horse in a Marshall 15, the fun meter goes from wherever it was, maybe three, and it's at zero, and it's at zero for a long time. It is no fun. You, you can be in front and you go right to the last. So um, uh, I think those are my main ones and I beat the five minute warning. So next. I think Charlie hit the tides stuff. Uh, look, we all race at high tides, right? So know your tide chart, know when you're coming out. The points he made about the tide, absolutely. You pay attention to them. I'm gonna morph this topic from tides actually to course because I realized we didn't have a course topic here. Because really what the next two are gonna be is what you're doing on the course. Uh, every day you're gonna go out there, whether you're on your own, whether you've got two people with you, three, whatever, Mark. Look at your course, like this little page here. Don't forget it and make sure that you pay attention to it across the line. And I'm sort of talking to myself here because um, it happens and you're like, geez, was it an F, was it an M? Which one was it? So it's really important to pay attention to your course, but not just for what you're gonna do at the start and what you're gonna do around the marks. It's setting yourself up. Is it a square course? Is it square to the wind? Is there a side that's favored? Um, might not know what that means, but it, it, you know, all of this wind direction and which way the wind's coming down the course matters when you're on that line. And whether you want to tack right away, you might think you won the start, but you're on the side that doesn't matter. You're, you know, the whole, the whole, which way the wind's flowing and where your mark is, is all about the race and getting around the course. If it's nice and square, it's easy. You're getting up to a weather mark and you can choose the side. But if you've got a course and that line and wind changes, it's not the race committee, the wind moves, not the boat. You got a side that's better and you got a side that's closer to that mark and you've got one that you want to get around. If that wind shifted around and now that mark looks like this, you got a side that's favored. It's a little closer to the mark. So depending on which way the wind's coming across the course tells you which way you want to be on the course. You always want to, and David had it at the beginning. Uh, he didn't say it specifically, but VMG, velocity made good. You always want to be going to that mark. And so you might think that you're ahead and you're with these other boats and you're all cruising up the course, but guess what? You guys are all sailing away from the mark sometimes. Sometimes attack away to get out of the fleet and to start thinking about the right direction and sailing closer to that mark matters. And the only way to do that is to think about your course all the time. And I think that, you know, th the next two topics will be how to get to that spot, but tides, wind, waves, all of that is about how to get to that mark best. And we, you know, whether you're on a Marshall or a Pintail or a Scott, it's all the same piece. Uh, you know, you're playing tactics not against the other people as much as you are against the wind. So you pay attention to it. Don't get, don't get lost on the course and think that you just got to keep going and keep going. Sometimes you, it's okay to slow down a little and tack away from that guy that's sitting on top of you and you can't get where you want to go and you're falling farther and farther and farther behind. Tack away. Um, but I think, uh, Charlie, you said it. 
Uh, these boats don't tack fast. We're not in little laser boats where you can roll tack these things and pop over to the next tack. You have to choose your tacks wisely, so don't get caught up tacking because you want to tack again and tack again. You will stop and you will stop moving. It'll take five, six, seven, ten boat lengths to move again. And, and it's always making sure you're pointing towards the mark. Um, I think there's a little piece in here about the t compass and how to focus on that part of it. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, like I said, ad libbing a topic here because tides, tides are tides, they're going in and out. Uh, we're sailing at the high tide. Think about when it's moving too fast, but think more about what that course is that you're on. Uh, David, I think you've got the next two topics, which are. No, I think it's Allie. Allie has it. Well, Allie was going to do tides, and we talked about it that tides really became course mm -hmm. because you touched on tides. Mm -hmm. So David's up. I've got a couple topics um, on the schedule, but um, what I'm going to do is divide. What are we doing? This? It's got to be waiting. There. Okay, I'm going to divide. So I'm talking about the start of the race, really important thing, <clears throat> because if you can get ahead of the start, it's so much easier to stay ahead than it is to try to catch up. But while we're thinking about the start, we really want to think about it in two distinct um, issues. One is strategy and one is tactics. Strategy is how are you going to sail the course in order to get through it the fastest? That is, if there were no other boats on the course, where would you go in order to take the least time to get from one place to another? And that's going to take into account current, wind, wind shifts, waves, and things like that. Tactics is how you interact with all the other boats that are preventing you from carrying out your strategy. And so whereas the first one kind of is relative to the whole fleet, tactics is relative to the one or two boats that are near you. And at the start, we have to think about both of these. So let's start off with a starting line and it's going to go from the um, buoy, which we usually call the pin, to a flag on the committee boat. And the very first thing in thinking strategically is where do I want to go way up there? And some of the considerations in deciding where you want to sail getting to the windward mark are wind speed. If it's a light day, but the wind's a little bit stronger over here, then you'd really like to sail most of your course over there. And you should set up at the, at the start so that you can get there sooner. Um, it might be that there's current moving across the course and that you want to stay away from that. It might be that in, it's a heavy day and the waves are really slowing you down. There are part of the course that has fewer waves. So the way that you might figure out at least what part of the upwind leg you want to sail in at the start is to go out and get there like an hour ahead of time and sail a lot of the first windward leg or where it's going to be. Um, now the next issue is where do I want to start along the line? And this is very simple. You want to start closer to the wind. So for instance, if the wind is coming this way, then if you have two boats, and they're both sailing at 45 degrees to the wind, then, and they, they have to start at the same line, then this one is going to cross ahead of that one um, because this end of the line is closer to the wind. It could be that the windward mark is way up here, and you might look, well, I should start down here because it's closer to the mark. But that's not a consideration. It doesn't matter whether the mark is on the left or the right. What you want to be is closer to the wind when you come off the line. So you have to figure out which end of the line is closer to the wind. And there are several ways to do it. The simplest way that I do most of the time is 
I just sail along, come to about halfway up the, the line, point the boat into the wind so the sail's slapping back and forth, and then I sit here and I kind of say, well, is that ahead of a perpendicular or is that behind a perpendicular? And most of the time that's good enough for me. You want to do it within like five minutes before the start because the wind can shift. And a line that was favored at one point, five minutes before the start, can suddenly change so that the other end of the line is favored. Okay. There are fancier ways using a compass. Um, and I don't know who's talking about compass here. Who's, are yeah, you going to talk about yeah, the compass for the start? I'll leave yeah. that for you then. Okay, so now the question is, we've got the at part of the line that we want to start at. That's the strategy part. That's going to get us closer to the wind soonest. What about all the other boats that have exactly the same idea? So let's take, um, imagine again that you have the committee boat and is favored because the wind is oriented this way, a little bit to the right of perpendicular, then you would like to come up with the boat and come right up here and get that perfect start that is as close to the windward end as you possibly can. How are you gonna do that? Well, all the boats are kind of lining up along here. And so maybe you think I'm just gonna come along here and then dip below the boat and get this perfect, and you, I can already hear the groans out there. <laughs> this is a really bad idea because, of course, the red boat is going to say no room, and now you're stuck. You could duck below the red boat, and now you're way down below the line. You could hit this boat and the committee boat and force your way through, and that is considered bad form. <laughs> um, or you could say, I've really messed up and tack around, and now you're four or five boat lengths behind. So two strategies are approach the boat as close hauled as you can be, and then it's really hard. You, you can keep the other boats out here, but it's really hard for another boat to be here and force you in. They can't sail any higher than you are. And so if you're coming along at 45 degrees to the wind and aiming for the quarter of the committee boat, that's pretty good. The second strategy, and this is makes more sense in even bigger fleets is say, I know it's gonna be a zoo here and it's a long line. If I can be here with good clear air, that's almost as good, it's almost as close to the wind as these boats. They're gonna be bashing each other and slowing down and I can come in with a top speed, hit the line directly um, along there and then as they're, they may be slightly closer to the committee boat, but I've got good speed and I'll be moving on. Same thing happens if the leeward end of the line is favored, if the pin end is favored. And so I'll draw the wind here. And now this end of the line is closer to the wind. The place that you would like to be is right there. And then there are all these other boats behind you, but you would have to have your timing absolutely perfect or you'll be at this position with four seconds to go and now you're in trouble. So you can go up and then come around, you can dip below, but either way you're going to give up an awful lot. So maybe it's better to say, let these guys get all jammed up at the pin and I'll come in here moving quickly, able to go across the line with you know, airflow attached across the sail, top speed, give up a little bit. So think about staying in from the end, whichever end is favored, in order to be able to avoid the jam up and be at top speed as you cross the line. Um, there are other things, but I probably will just leave it at that to save time. Good job. <laughs> I'm going to do a double dip. I missed the waves before, um, uh, and then I have compass. So I'm going to go backwards on compass because uh, this is set up here. Um, so a, a compass is a really good tool 
to use when you're sailing out there because um, you're not in the middle of the ocean. You don't need the compass to know whether you're going north, south, east, or west. You have all sorts of points of reference. If you look at High Pines, you know you're going east. If you look at David's house, you know you're going west. Got that part pretty much figured out. So what is it good for? It's good for a lot of tactics um, because it, it, it lets you know what the wind is doing. So I'll always look at sail flow. I'll always look at see what the, what the world is telling us the wind is going to do. But then I always go out there and use my compass to see if it's actually happening or how fast it's happening. And so um, if I'm late, like I already told you, I almost always am. The easiest way to do is just go head to wind. Just head right into the wind. Look at your compass. That's where the wind's coming from. You've got a, you've got a baseline point because the whole idea with a compass is find a baseline. So if you have the baseline and it's 360 degrees due north, okay, great. I know that's where the wind is coming from. I'm going to be 45 degrees off of that, give or take, um, if I'm sailing upwind. Um, and if all of a sudden, the next time I come head to wind, it's 10 degrees, not 360, it's 10, then I say, okay, this thing's shifting to the right. So that helps me understand, okay, the wind's moving to the right. It changes what I might want to do strategically, but it definitely tells me, okay, I, 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 should, I should tack over and grab this lift because I'm getting headed. So the key is getting a baseline. As David said, the better way to do it is go out early and just um, go close hauled, do it three or four times on the same tack, and then find out what that median is. So it's always going to drift around a little bit. It's always going to move a little bit. Um, but you'll find basically, okay, it's 45 or help me Greg math, 360, uh, uh, 315 on the other side. Um, and, and you just use those points. Um, so tip or trick, um, trying to grab pencil. You can write, you can write, you can just write on your boat, just literally write, write on the, where you're sailing, um, just put it against the bulkhead and just write down what the um, cor course is. When I go to the commuter boat in Boston, I park in s slot 241. By the time I walk to pay for it, I've forgotten what freaking place I was in. I have to go back and look, oh, I'm in 241. So like write it down. Like the wind is coming from 360, the wind is coming from 15, and then, then you know, or you have a crew member that helps you out in that way and just says it out loud. But use that, use that as, because that's the key, whether it's setting yourself up strategically before the start as to which side of the course you want to go to, or tactically when you're getting headed as you sail upwind. Keep in mind that, um, uh, and this will be a decent, um, uh, let me just see if there's anything else on that. Oh, last thing, sounds silly, didn't, I never even thought about it, but you've got a compass, right? 360, 180. If you're on, if you're on port tack, if I'm coming across on port tack, if your numbers are going higher, um, if the, I'm sorry, if the, mum, if the numbers are going lower, you're getting lifted. If you're on starboard tack, if the numbers are going higher, you're getting lifted. So same thing, you have a compass and you're sailing along at 180 and now it's 185 and it's 190 and you're on starboard tack, stay with it. You're just getting a nice lift. So just remember, starboard tack, numbers go up, you're getting lifted. Port tack, numbers are going down, you're getting lifted. Doesn't matter where you are on that entire circle. It's a given. Um, so use that and obviously, the opposite holds true. <laughs> so if you're on starboard tack and the numbers are going down, you're getting headed, time to roll over. Um, keep in mind too that tactically when you use a compass, as you get closer to the mark, you may be getting headed, your compass may be telling you you're getting headed, but it's not, in a cat boat, it's not worth giving up the two or three boat lengths to tack. You, you may just eat the 5%. Um, good segue to waves, when you have, if it's a wavy day, right? Um, uh, the boat's going to turn slower. You need more room for everything. So a five instead of a 5% header, a 10% header on a wavy day, whatever. Once it gets to 15%, you, might, you may want to do something about it, but the waves are going to push you around that a lot more. So when you're using a compass on a wavy day, just understand you're going to get a lot more variability. Don't jump, don't jump at a tack just because you, you, know, you see a five degree difference. Um, on a cat boat, that rarely pays off. Um, waves. Quickie on this one, um, what's the objective? Use them to your advantage. Um, waves can be good, waves can be bad. You're going downwind, you have some nice waves, put them behind you, ride them. Um, you're going upwind, um, you can ride up over a wave and then ride down the, the front side of it. So you can use waves to your advantage if you think about it that way, but they can be, um, they can be very problematic <laughs> otherwise. Um, 
So wind-driven waves are one thing. Wind-driven waves usually aren't a big deal. Wind wins over waves 90% of the time. But um, if they're wind-driven waves, you have plenty of wind. The boat's going to power through the wind, the waves. You know, don't worry about it. On a light wind day, like we talked about before, if the, if the wind's dying off, the easterly's dying off, whatever, then that's different. You have to pay a lot more attention to what the waves are doing. If you're, we've set up over in Powder Point a lot. If you're heading up towards Powder Point, I call it Alligator Alley. You get, look, what, five, ten Grady Whites blasting in there <laughs> to water ski. Like, I pay a ton of attention to boat waves. Okay, so those are another kind of waves. So you can have wind-driven waves, you can have current-driven waves, which we don't really have a lot of here, but you have a lot of boat-driven waves. I spend a ton of time looking at what Grady Whites are doing, and I, I'm, I'm not bashing them, I'm just telling you what, like it is. <laughs> when you see a, a boat going by, I'll tack to make sure that that wave is hitting me on my, on my, you know, on, on my side and I'm not plowing through it. I pay a lot of attention to what the boats are doing around me and particularly if you're getting up toward, toward Powder Point where there's a lot of boat traffic. If you get down by Nun Falls, there's a lot of boat traffic. So pay a lot of attention to what those, um, those are doing. Um, uh, e sheet, head lower, power up. If they're waves, just power through them. It's worth it. Just drop off a little bit, power through them. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too is the wind's coming out of the due north. Um, sometimes um, sometimes the, the waves aren't symmetrical to that. Sometimes the waves are coming 10 or 15 degrees off. So on one tack, you actually can point and really ride them. On the other tack, you have to, you have to adjust and you have to power up and just think about keeping boat speed. So keep in mind, if the, if the waves aren't parallel with the wind, each tack, you need to do something different. One's going to be a power tack. The other one's going to be pointing. Power, point. Don't try to do the same thing. And in fact, you can adjust your peak a little bit if you want to. You can adjust your board a little bit if you need to on that side of things. So the other thing with waves, just leave room, leave more room for everything. Your lay lines go out further. Um, uh, the start, you're going to get to the start later. Um, your buoy roundings are going to be dicier with other boats around you. Um, uh, a lee bow, if you come up on a lee bow on a wavy day, way more effective than on a, on a calm day. Because remember, you've got about a 10%, you know, the boat's going up and down by 10%. You lee bow somebody on a wavy day, all of a sudden they have to start pinching on a wavy day. They've lost all their power. They're going to tack away. You've got them. You, you can just force them away from you that way. So just remember that on a wavy day, there's a lot more variability in what's going on that way. So the more waves than there is wind, power. The more wind than there is waves, point. Easiest way to think of it. You have a lot of wind, you have a lot of wind, point. If you have a lot of waves and not enough wind, just power that boat up. Um, and the last thing I would say with waves, just go around them. <laughs> Don't go through them. Go around them. Whether, whether you're going downwind or upwind or otherwise, whether it's a Grady White or wind-driven waves, just think about it. Like, how do I go around this wave? How do I use it to my advantage? Don't try to go through the waves. It never works. talk about wind attack. There's a lot of times to attack. Um, I'm going to go back to the course chart. It, it matters. Uh, you know, if you're racing, knowing where you're heading is all that matters, right? So timing that tack is a factor of everything these guys have just gone through. It's your sails, it's the wind, it's the waves, it's your competition. But it's also what you're trying to get to. So. I love your compass. I love your compass. But I'm going to throw a different one. Um, you know, look, we, we, we said it. We don't tack these boats a lot. We're not in little dinghies. We can't roll tack them. So we tend to sort of hit one side and go up and try to get up to a weather mark. Now, every, all the factors that we've just went around affect this. So if I'm a boat that's behind another boat, like this, Chances are, my course is going to be a little different than his because I don't have as good a wind. What does that mean? It means he's going faster to where he wants to go. So wind attack is when you realize that you can get out from away from him. But might have another boat here. Might have another boat here. So everybody's playing that game. 
What do I do? Some, you know, I don't stay here. There's, there's nothing good about being below everybody else. And in racing, we do what's called covering. So if I go and I say, look, I can't sit here because we can't always be in front all the time. We would like to be, right? <laughs> it, it would be nice, but sometimes we have to get out of there. And it's just like, you can't, you can't be under these boats. So a good time to tack would be right now. Get out of there, get some speed, and get moving. We talked about it before, get your boat moving, keep your boat moving, go around a wave, get going the right direction, avoid you know, other boats. Get this moving, get this moving. Chances are this guy's gonna see you go. He's gonna tack to cover. You know, he's gonna try to stay on top of you. So you, you, know, you start to play that game of, I'm, I'm playing these two boats. Now this guy's out on his own. Right, this is where we start to get into a split, a split field. So these guys are going, they're, they're racing their race, but I, 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 I might not be paying attention. So back to the compass. I've got a compass that says I need to get over here. I, I totally lost track of where I was going. I was like, oh, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Oh, geez, I'm going to tack. I, I've totally oversteered the mark. I lost track of where I was going. So back to that course. Always remember where you're trying to get. Look up field to see what's happening, what direction the other boats are sailing. Because if you're over here and these boats are about to make that, you're, you're too late. You've got to tack. And we see it 